Welcome to episode two of Making It, a bi-weekly podcast about making things with your bare hands, hosted by Jimmy DiResta, Bob Cleggett, and myself, David Picciuto. And we're going to go ahead and get started and talk about what we uh, what we got going on and what we're working on right now. Jimmy, what you got going on? Uh, hey, what's up, guys? Thank you for listening. I am putting together the finishing touches on a few videos. Uh, tomorrow, a video premieres on Make Magazine's channel, where I make a swing out of a log. It seems, I seem to kind of have this ongoing theme on Make Magazine. I keep making things from logs, and I didn't notice it until I look back. <laughs> I made like four things out of logs. Anyway, this week I make a swing at a log. It's an interesting segment in there where I tie an interesting knot, like I weave rope back into itself, so that's kind of cool. And uh, I just finished. I'm still tweaking it, but I'm finishing up the video where I show off my shop. And I have Tools and Toys, and that's going to be the name of the video, Tools and Toys. And uh, I... I'm about to build a big giant bar for Crown Royal, and I'm going to document that whole video as well. So that has to be done December 5th. So I look forward to that. Nice. Now, did you chop down this tree for the log? No, actually, I didn't. Um, uh, if anybody's following my videos, you'll notice I chopped down a tree just to prove that my axe works. <laughs> <laughs> because of the haters, they kind of got me ear. Like, I got one, one comment, and I was like, I'm going to show this MF that this thing works. And I went out into the woods. <laughs> And I chopped the tree down based on the one person's comment. After nine months, it finally pushed me over the edge. Uh, but the previous day, I made the, the swing video. So I chopped the tree down and posted it on my channel. And tomorrow on Make Channel, you're going to see me cut a segment of a tree that a beaver cut down. But to the unattentive eye, it's going to look like I chopped down this tree and then I went back and made a swing out of it. Mm. So, I mean, it just happened by accident. Because I was spontaneous about cutting the tree down on the second day. I had already made the swing. But um, I am going to use the chopped down tree to make some stuff. So I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. So the video will pick up again after I chopped it down. Me dragging it out of the woods and doing something with it. Not sure yet. Very cool. All right, Bob, what you got going on? Uh, I'm finishing up um, a video about some reclaimed wood signs that have, have like acrylic logos mounted in them and then LED lights mounted in them. So... The wood is all really, really rough palette stuff, but they're super bright LEDs and you know white and black acrylic. And I got a chance to use the new carving machine uh, from Inventables, and so I got the acrylic cut out on that. And so along with that, I have a, a video um, about how to use Easel, their software, similar to the one that you did, David, a while back. But is that made, the Shapeco? Is that the sh- it's called Shapeco? That the Shapeco is the CNC that I have and David has as well. Right. And their new machine is called Carvey and it's it's pretty much the same as far as what it can produce, but it's more of a desktop not a shop tool. It's it's more something you would put on your desk in a studio, you know, it's all enclosed and It's not open source. You can't go and replace parts and stuff. Right. But, yeah. Right. It, right. It is a slick piece of hardware. Definitely. It but. looks it looks awesome. I like the fact that it's enclosed and you could have it in your office if you wanted to. Yeah. And they're saying that you can like talk on the phone right next to it while it's running. Oh, which nice. is that's pretty wild. Yeah. And it's a reductive like CNC machine? Yeah, it's CNC. Yep. That's great. Yeah. So I'm finishing up the those two projects and then doing a bunch of new got a bunch of new video work just to do kind of keep up my channel and keep up my Patreon page and all that stuff. So what about you, David? Uh, I, I've got two handmade shows coming up. There is a event in Toledo called Maker's Mart, and it's just a bunch of handmade people selling their stuff. That's sometime later in November. There's not many woodworkers. There's just usually like two or three woodworkers, but there's like dressmakers and, and leather workers and, and jewelry people and stuff. So I'm getting ready for that. Lots of little crafty things. And then at the beginning of December, I'm going to Cleveland for what's called Manly Mart. And it's a craft show uh-huh. nice. for men by men. Awesome. So, yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's kinda, cool. Yeah, I'm kind of freaking out about this because I don't, uh, I'm running out of time and I don't know what I'm going to take there. So I, right now I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm just, I might just make a bunch of alcohol based items. Like, I was going to say, make some whiskey stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like that. More like whiskey flights and beer flights and, and beer caddies and stuff like that and maybe coasters. I have been, I've been trying to think really hard how I could take my Shape Oko there mm. and make stuff on the fly and i and i don't know what that item would be so if anybody has an idea of like personalized coasters or something that I could whip out in like five minutes and yeah I, I did i did uh coasters from pallet wood i cut a bunch of squares 
took them to Maker Faire and had kids come up and tell me their name and I would put it into easel, print them. Like it literally took a minute and a half nice. and they were walking away with the coaster. So oh, that's that. cool. what was the failure rate? I, I had no failure at all because the, you know, the cuts were really shallow. It was just like an engraving yeah. V bit. So it didn't, it was one pass. There just yeah. wasn't a whole lot of room for failure. So very cool. Yeah. The V bits do a really nice job. I've never worked with the V bit. So, Oh, no, the V-Bits are great. You can get really beautiful serif faces and sans serif faces. Incredible. In fact, I saw a video today, and uh, Blazing Nail Gun is the channel. And he's a really nice guy. We started talking. He's a really cool dude. Southern guy making stuff. Makes uh, Basically, he's a full-on carpenter. And he made, on his new CNC machine, it's new to him, it's a big machine, he made a, a ruler, similar to the ruler that uh, April made recently. And um, but he CNC'd his letters and his num his numbers are beautiful, beautiful serif face numbers with a with a V bit. So it's a good example to take a look. Blazing nail gun, and it's like a video we posted about two weeks ago of a ruler. That 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 ruler is a, a like a like a height ruler for kids, right? To to mark exactly, yeah. Growth. It's a, it's it looks like a bigger ruler, but it's actually one foot increments. Nice, very cool. Okay, so this. This week, what we were going to talk about a little bit was, was how materials and tools inspire our creativity. And uh, we were just talking about the CNC machine. And that's a, a perfect segue because when I first got my CNC machine, I had a little bit of a hard time trying to figure out what I wanted it. Like, what I, I knew that I needed it because I was meeting kids at Make Affair that were making these cool objects. And in my mind, I kind of was being the old grump saying, I could do that on the band, so I don't need a CNC machine. And then I saw like like beautiful inlay pieces and really cool things that were going on on YouTube and and of course at Make a Fair and I, I really was resisting it. I felt like this inner thing inside of me saying, "You don't need that." And then there was like the little voice in my head saying, "Wait, open your mind a little bit. Maybe you do need it." And so I just plopped down the credit card. Ultimately, after seeing after three Make Affairs, I just plopped down a credit card and I bought the ShopBot desktop and. I really had to kind of stretch my mind to try and figure out what I was going to use it for. And one of the first things I did was I made this kind of stamped wallet. I was so excited to be able to engrave my name in plastic in reverse and then impress it into leather. So the way it inspired me was I was trying to figure out ways to use the CNC machine but not have the product come directly off of the pallet. I wanted to be able to utilize it and then take it three steps away from it so that I could have the CNC machine be a part of the process but not be the process. Uh, and actually, that really was my focus in the beginning. And it's really has come real natural to me because I'd be in the middle of making something and then I realize I'm like, damn, it's something i got to make 10 times and it's got to be perfect. And then that little angel on my shoulder says, why don't you just use the CNC, stupid? And I'm like, oh, perfect. I forgot I have a CNC because I'm so old school. I just think of band saws and routers and table saws. And so it's really become a great, part of what I do, especially now that I've been doing so much branding. And uh, Oh, I have a video coming out too called uh, I Make These Boxes for George Dickel. I, I mentioned them, I think, in the last podcast, but they've been going through the approval process of deciding whether they want the video out or not. And I think I'm going to get to be able to publish the video. I just got to make a few tweaks in it. But in it, of course, I use the CNC machine to do the branding on the opening of the box, on the front of the box. And uh, Without it, I wouldn't even have thought to do it. I would have just like figured out how to do like a acetone transfer or a silk screen or something. But now it's actually engraved in the box. And they just gave me an order to make 30 more. So I actually, I'm trying to improve what I did. You'll see the video comes out and you'll notice things that bother me about the box. So I'm making 30 more. So I'm trying to up these, I'm trying to up the production value. And so instead of using the CNC, I might actually go and find somebody with a laser. Mm. So that the logo looks a little bit more crisper and is burned. So you have like the darks and lights. Instead of what I've done is I just use the V-bit to engrave just all the, the vector lines. So if I use a a laser, the laser would give me nice darks and lights. So there yeah. is the process inspiring the, the product. So Yeah, on that same note, I have experimented a little bit with doing um, V-bit cuts and, or painting the surface and then doing the cut or staining oh, yeah. the surface and doing the cut and you get that nice contrast you know by pre-finishing or post-finishing and sanding or you know there's some cool ways when you cut away stuff like that it, it's interesting that you say that about the CNC because I kind of came into the same 
uh, place. When I, I actually ordered mine after seeing you do so much stuff with yours, and I think we oh, talked cool. about uh, we talked about that on Instagram or something. You know, I was like, I got to figure out how to oh, get yeah. a CNC, and I, I can't I remember, afford the one that he has. But I couldn't I can, afford it either. I just <laughs> put it on a credit card, and, and I actually. <laughs> I always think to myself, oh, I'll just put. I, that's how I buy tools. Sometimes when I buy expensive tools, I just put them on a credit card, and I was like, "Hopefully this works." Yeah, <laughs> that's really all I do. I just but it, but it was kind of after seeing you use it in a, in such a good way, I I was like, "Yeah, that's something I should I should get." And then I got it, and and just like you said, I I was like, "Okay, now what do I do with it?" I, I don't I don't know what to do with it, and it has turned into more of a producing pieces that you then use to produce something else. Like just today. Right. Um, a long time ago, I did a video about how to make a vacuum former. And so it was really simple. And then I used that vacuum former to make an on-air sign. And in that on-air sign, I glued some plastic letters on a piece of wood, vacuum formed those so that I had the plastic imprint, all that stuff. So I'd done that before. Today, I had to do another one of those, but I had to do a different a set of letters. And so rather than going through the process of you know getting the letters or anything, I said, oh, I can use the CNC to cut these letters out, glue them to a piece of wood, you know. I, I didn't end up using the final pieces that I got from the CNC, but they were the piece that I used to to make the final plastic piece. So, and and I'm actually looking at you know I have a 3D printer coming pretty soon, and I'm I'm in the same awesome. place where I'm like right. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. People keep asking me, "What are you going to make with it?" I, I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'll figure it out. It's so weird that Jimmy inspired you, Bob, to get in CNC. And then you inspired me to get one because because <laughs> <we, laughs> Bob and I had a conversation like I'm, I'm looking at all these CNCs, but, you know, I'm on a Mac and all the software just looks really bad or horrible or it's for PCs. And Bob's like, you got to check out the Shape Oko. And I did. And I think it took me, you know, less than two days. And I, you know, got out the credit card and, and bought it. And I, and I love it. And like everybody else, I got this machine it actually took me a long time to put it together a couple months but really long time yeah really long time yeah i announced it to the world like hey, i got a cnc and then every every day i get emails like how are you coming along in that cnc i'm like i don't have it together yet and it's one of the, the shape oko is like the cnc it like takes 10 to 12 hours to put together because you are piecing together every single little piece including the bearings and, and the rails and stuff when i got it i was like what can i do that nobody else is doing with this and so uh that's I I don't want to do the same thing everybody else is doing, and so my first thought was I don't think anybody's ever made a bandsaw box with CNC inlay in it, and so then I made a video on that, and yep. that actually got uh, Inventables it, it got their attention the the maker of the Shape Oko, and, and we've been working together on some projects now. So yeah, when I get a tool, I'm like, how can I use this different than anybody else? Yeah, I'm the same way. I always try and think, especially to keep my own personal boredom from creeping in, but also just to keep making my videos look a little bit visually different from previous videos. Same thing. Like how, how am I going to use this differently or just at least introduce a new trick or something. And, and you know, the CNC and the 3d printers, that, that type of tool, I think fall, um, a lot to people saying like, that's taking away from, like there's a lot of backlash against in in the woodworking community at least against oh, yeah. you know using I this know type people of people that will absolutely they, they they my friend absolutely thinks it's like blasphemy. I yeah. said, but why? It makes no sense like just use it along with. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in place of. I think I think people think that it takes and and it makes sense that people would think this, but I think they they think it takes the place of the the craftsmanship that, you know that you're just sitting in a computer and all you have to do is think of hey I want this thing to be done and then that thing is done and that's it's not at all like that I mean the process of getting an idea onto the computer in a way that the machine can understand it and you know th there's a lot more to that and 3D printing is even worse because oh, yeah. it's you know there's just like a whole other realm to it that I I'm a literally little, yeah I'm on, like on a CNC little scared machine. of that. On the CNC machine, I, I've only ever done 2D vectors. I don't need to. I so far haven't really needed 3D. Yeah. You know, with, with uh, once you go into 3D, uh, I, I when I first got my CNC machine, it sat in the corner of the, the basement. You'll see it in the video where it's sitting. It sat there for two months before I even really delved into the software to try and figure out how to use it, because the support videos are horrible for it. They don't even make sense on that particular brand, and. Uh, when I finally did get into it, I totally was utilizing the software the wrong way. 
So when I finally went to make a fair and I sat with the people at Shopbot, they were extremely helpful and showed me the got me up right on course. And after my meeting with them at Make a Fair, I was like on my way. I never had to call them again because I, I, when I did get into it, I was calling them every day. Like, why is this? How come this? This doesn't seem to work. But anyway, I, I got on my way with it, and it's fantastic. But people keep asking me, to your point, Bob. When are you going to get a 3D printer? And I personally don't need one, but I also know that introduces the full-on, full-time third axis that you need to figure out how high, where, and this, that, and the other thing. You know, if you're going to make 3D parts, I don't personally think I need it yet. I did years ago when I was making parts for the toy business. But nowadays, I'm just doing signage and branding and, you know, making cool parts. Actually, on my new Instagram, the rest of the shop, David, my assistant, took some pictures of uh, of this bamboo thing, one of my clients came up with, and it, he's an architect, and we, we came up with this. He came up with a piece of furniture. It's a modular, and it all, it's a system. And when I looked at his design, I was like, "Dude, we could make this whole thing on the CNC machine with no hand labor, other than assembling it and tweaking it." And uh, so you'll see pieces of this prototype that I made in in the pictures that David's going to post maybe tonight. Anyway. I would never have been able to do that without the CNC machine. And I wouldn't even have been in that head to do that. I would have just been at the bandsaw for hours, cutting out the same shape over and over and over again. Hmm. But you know, it's funny how this new technology has totally opened up a whole new realm for me. And like I said, I jumped in the pool not knowing where I was going to go. The same with you. And you know, now all of a sudden, it's like a whole new way of thinking that just kind of happens naturally. Yeah, I think that's the key too. It's not that you're taking it to replace your bandsaw work, right? I mean, right. that's something you're known for, and that's something you're really good at. But you didn't get it, so you wouldn't have to do that work. And that's, no, not at all. I that's just the wanted... important thing that people, I think, don't think about when they talk down about the automation tools. You know, I, I personally, I, I'm a type snob, and uh, I know Dave, you must be a type snob. <laughs> I mean, because uh, I know you got good branding, and and you know, you're a graphic designer. But when I make letters on the band, so even like one of my videos, the High Line, I, I said if I'm gonna hand freehand this, it's gotta really look good, especially on video. So I was, I really took my time to make sure that I was on the line with the machine. But the best thing about the CNC machine is I can make perfect type as long as it fits onto the plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so that's that's the one thing I love about it. It's like because I'm like I made a little tiny plaque that is literally this big. It goes on like a, a thing a little plaque for one of my clients in serif, beautiful serif face, copper plate Gothic. It looks amazing. And I used a little tiny, uh, 60 degree V bit to do it. And it looks beautiful. It's, they loved it. It looks like something from the 1930s. That's what it was supposed to look like. Mm. I, I, they had this prop already made and they just wanted the plate, like the museum plate for it, just to mimic a vintage plate. And it looked great. And I was amazed. I was like, I'll try it. I'll see what happens. I did it three times. The third time it came out perfect. I see myself using my CNC machine not so much as in woodworking, but more in art, like wall hangings and stuff. Because I'm uh, a vector-oriented person. I'm always drawn an illustrator, and so that translates well yeah. to the CNC. And so, perfect. I, I can you know I can take all these drawings that I have and and cut them out on the CNC and out of pieces of wood and plastic and aluminum and and make art out of it. So. Now, have you had art inspired by that so far? Like, are, are you getting ideas that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? No, no. Um, only because I haven't used it that much. You know, I just got it. I just got the machine together two months ago, and I've used it twice. Uh, I I just need to get myself more familiar with it, use it more, and and I'm sure that machine will inspire things in the future. But as of right now, it has not. Just to get you going, I mean, what, what? Just to maybe give you some inspiration. When I first got it, of course, you know, I'm a logo whore. I'm always doing my logo. I, I just started making my own logo, just because I didn't know what else to do. I had no clients to make yeah. anything on, so I just started doing my Duresta logo. Yeah. Um, and your your logo, your script logo, would look really nice, you know, in scene. So if you start experimenting with the levels, like setting the background back or setting the actual typeface back or vice versa, experimenting, putting a couple of extra borders around it and deciding what goes up, what goes down, how deep. You know, that's a good yeah, exercise. That definitely definitely be a good good learning 
exercise for it. Yeah. And then you end up with a cool result that you know you put on your desk when you're at a sales show, show or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, so I actually just, had a, another use for mine recently that was kind of out of the blue. A good friend of mine um, for Halloween wanted to be Star Lord from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. So he found this pattern for the helmet. It's this really complicated helmet with all these different layers and pieces and all this stuff. And he found a pattern for it and uh, started cutting them out of foam by hand. And it's that foam, like the mats that you stand on. And you can heat right. it and you can mold it and all that stuff. But there was a lot of detail to it that he wasn't going to be able to do on his own. And so he called me and said, like, hey, can I use your CNC for this? I have the patterns and vector. And, you know, so all of a sudden I'm like cutting out these faceplate things with like these weird little vents and like hoses and all this stuff that I never would have done on my own. But right. it turned out that it was just the perfect tool for that particular job, you know, and seeing that process and seeing him go from like raw material foam to a finished like really well painted helmet with electronics in it and all this stuff that's got me really wanting to do some sort of prop replica so now I'm on the hunt for finding the right prop that I want to do you know that's going to end up using all my tools you know to to do that thing so it is interesting to see how just having something around can produce some stuff that you weren't expecting. Nice. Was that the mask that you posted on Facebook a couple of days ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put it on Instagram too. It turned out great. I, I had some LED strips left over from the signs I was talking about earlier. And so he was trying to figure out how to light the eyes of this mask. And so we just grabbed some of this extra strip that I had laying around and wired it up. It turned out really cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I just uh, recently talked about materials. I... I knew I wanted to use aluminum on something, and one of my upcoming videos is I use a I make aluminum, I use aluminum to make a handle for a hatchet, and uh, aluminum cuts just like wood on the bandsaw. When, I, when when this video comes out, people are going to be like, me and me and my assistant laugh. We go, people are going to like be so upset they're not even going to know how to handle it. The trolls. <laughs> <laughs> the, I've, I've personally, and you guys could read my comments on my axes, the few videos I use axes, the, the axe community is such a traditional, like closed-minded, only one way to do things, only one finish, there's only one way to use an axe. Axe holes. They're crazy. And, uh, yeah, axe holes, totally, because <laughs> they forgot that, you know, we've all, we've all evolved from you know, Neanderthals that used a, a rock tied to a stick and before that just a piece of flint. And they think like we're at the end of that evolution right now. We're done. Axes are done evolving and they're not going to keep going on. You know, I, I know somebody just came out with this new recent axe that hits the wood and splits it. You know, so the axes and everything and things keep evolving. And so aluminum, I thought, what can I make out of aluminum? And that could look good on camera. And I knew that I could bring it to a polish just from my own personal experience. So it could start out as this like square chunk and then turn into something sexy and smooth. And, and uh, it occurred to me to make an axe handle. So that's a video that's coming up. So that, that's how uh, that particular idea w was generated. I started out with aluminum. Where do you get a chunk of aluminum so big? Metalsonline.com. And what's great is you can buy in, in you could buy an 18-inch piece you could buy the profiles. So when you look on the page, you see the profiles. It's like one by two, one and a half by two, one and a half by three, one and a half by four. That's the profile. And then the length is 18 inches. Or in the video, you'll see I kind of dropped the piece into camera in the beginning and it falls like a baseball bat. And it was about 30 inches by one and a half by three. So it's like the size of a two by four, but in aluminum. Wow. It's really a great piece. Do you need to swap out the the blade on your bandsaw to cut aluminum no actually i use the i use the a half inch resaw blade with the seven tooth per inch and it cut perfect wow a little secret in the video you see me starting to cut it and then it's just across it cross dissolves into the the cut going quickly because the blade i first started with i knew was dull i'm like let me just see how this works so i started and the blade was too dull so i shut the camera off and i changed the blade to a brand new resaw blade and it cuts beautifully. So the whole video, I cut the aluminum on a wooden 7 TPI hmm. half inch thick resaw blade and it cuts perfect. Nice. Hmm. The only thing is the chips fly everywhere. So what you don't see is like I have a hood on and I'm wearing like a full face mask. So none of those chips get in my eye. But I didn't even film, I just filmed my hands. 
Yeah, so that's hopefully I'm going to try and finish that up. We're just going to do some leather work on the handle before the video gets closed. And then uh, I'm actually, I'm doing pretty good. I'm about three or four videos ahead, which is wow. kind of hard to be. You know, I'm like usually always behind. So I have a couple of videos in the shoot that I just got to hit the button to publish. So Now, how, did, how long did it take you to get from, I mean, I know you work on a lot of things at one time, but to take a, a big block of aluminum, aluminum down to that shape, I've seen it, you know, and it's it's very contoured and very finished and very polished. How, did, how long did it take to get to that point? If I didn't, you know, I work a couple hours a night on this and after my other work, probably from start to finish, I could probably get to where if I just keep working, like four hours. Wow. Just work it in four hours, yeah. But, but like, I, I ended up on this particular video, I ended up filing the shape after the band, so I didn't use a sander because the, the files actually do quicker, more accurate work. And so uh, that's what took a lot of time is I just literally, in the video you'll see, I bandsaw it, I get it to as much of the sexy shape that I can get it, and then uh, I use files to get rid of the bandsaw marks and then to blend all the facets. And uh, then I use a palm sander, then scotch Bright and steel wool, and then a buffing wheel. Yeah, I saw photos of it, and it looks shiny and smooth and buttery and... Oh, yeah, so, it's yeah. so nice. Yeah. I, 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 each night, my girlfriend says she's going to do the leather work, so I keep. I brought it home twice so far in the last couple of days. So the walk from my shop to my apartment is two blocks, and in that walk, I stop and I see friends and I show them the axe, and everybody's like, "Oh my god, <laughs> that thing is so sexy!" I can just picture I, you walking down the streets <laughs> in New York holding a giant axe, <laughs> and it's real well, shiny too, so the light hits it and it yeah, blinds oh, people. Yeah, yeah. Like Batman over here. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's so funny I just stopped I had to stop and chat with uh, my friend Steve Marcus who's, a, who's actually a really accomplished artist he's if you google him he's probably got some great stuff he's done lots of like album cover art and stuff and uh, we were just talking and the whole time I'm like holding the axe under my arm and, and then a cop pulls somebody over right there I'm like oh geez <laughs> I take the axe I stick it in my jacket because the cop will see that and he'll take it away from me and put me in handcuffs so I uh that's, you know, I'm half in the country, half in the city, so I got to remember that I'm in the city sometimes. So I just tucked it under my shirt, under my, my hoodie, just so the. the you know how wouldn't... many views uh, that video would get if you got <laughs> captured on, on video of you getting arrested? <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. I had my GoPro with me, too. I should yeah. have it to my chin. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not worth getting arrested over, but it would be good. I don't know. Yeah. That's a lot of AdSense money right there. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that, you know, I always, I, I always anticipate the day that a cop is going to stop me and pat me down. I got like five knives on me. I got an ice pick. I'm carrying an axe. I'm like, oh, he's never going to believe anything I say. <laughs> Bob, do you carry a knife on you? I do. Um, yeah, I've got a Gerber Crucial, and it's a multi-tool. And I've tried out a bunch of different ones, actually, but this is the one that I found uh, had enough stuff to be useful but not too much. Most of them are just really... You know, they're they're just stuff I would never use, but this one's really cool. I've been really happy with it, and I've actually thought about buying five or six more of them just to keep on hand because I have a feeling they're going to stop making it at some point. I'm really going to want to keep. What's it called again? Because I've been looking for a good multi tool to to carry around. Uh, it's by Gerber. And it's called the Crucial, and there's there's they have a few different ones. This one uh, is really cool because it has the blade on it. It has a stub nose, so it doesn't go to a point. And um, I mean, it, it, you know, it doesn't go to a point like most knives. It does have a point, but everything's locking on it. So it's got Phillips and flathead. It's got a, a carton cutter. It's got a few other things, and then it opens up in the middle with pliers. Um, but one of the things I really liked the most about it is all the edges of it have bevels, and so it's in my pocket, and I stick my hand in. There's no sharp edges that rough up my hand, and every other one I ever tried had these nasty exposed edges so and it's black and it's black it looks badass yeah yeah it looks cool i carry the mutt lately but if i had to really put my money on i would always carry the surge by leatherman this i like i like the mutt just because it looks cool but the surge is much more useful and the surge is sort of more of their traditional looking one from the beginning of time but the blades are on the outside of the handle so you can access the blades quickly you don't have to always open it completely up so the surge is good, and the mud is the mud. Like I said, I like the mud, but it's just uh, the one actually good thing about the mud I use most often is this this hammer butt. It's got like a hammer butt on it, so you could like bang on stuff. Hmm. 
and I find myself re- reaching for it all the time. Where do you guys carry this at? Like a front pocket, or you have a, like a, a belt clip or something? Yeah, mine's front. on my belt, right on my belt all the time. I do front right pocket. I have other things. I have I carry everything. Jimmy's <laughs> Jimmy's everyday carry is insane. <laughs> I, I would imagine it would be. Yeah, <laughs> I carry uh, the, uh, my video. I kind of obviously amped it up a little bit. My EDC video, but. I always carry a Leatherman. I always carry a pocket knife, and I always carry an ice pick, a lighter, and a Micra. A Micra is the small Leatherman. That's a pair of scissors. So those are the things I have on me always. And if if I'm at a wedding <laughs> where I have to wear like you know regular clothes that aren't like pocketed, the, they're nearby. I will always like at least carry the Leatherman with me, and then the other stuff is like in my car. Well, you said you you tear through garbage to look. And see how things are made all the time and stuff, right? Oh, so. always. Yeah, I'm always taking things apart and breaking it or whatever. But yeah. Oh, you know what? I always, also, almost always, always carry two. And I lose them so often. Every time I'm in Walmart, I buy four or five of them. These uh, Stanley razor blades. And lately, I buy the ones that have a, sort of a carabiner on the end because I can clip it on my belt loop and I never lose it. Mm. But the oldest style one just has the, the belt clip. And by the time I'm looking for it, three or four hours in between, the last time I used it, I, I, I lose them, literally. And now at my lawn upstate, which you'll see in my, my tools and toys video, I mow the lawn a lot and I lose, to, I lose my razor blades on the lawn mower. I probably lost five of them in the grass and occasionally they just churn up. Actually, I lost two Leathermen up in my property, which churned up over the last 10 years. So, so if you ever visit Jimmy's place, <laughs> don't roll around in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> You might you might get stabbed by one of my razors or or an old <laughs> leather man. <laughs> yeah, recently I lost an ice pick at. Uh, if anybody's in Connecticut, there's a, a great flea market called the Elephant's Trunk, which is about two hours away from the city, and it's amazing. And I'll tell you a really stupid, funny, serendipitous story. I was there, and we it was a really hot day a few months ago, and we sat down in the grass to kind of have a lemonade tail of my girlfriend and I. And when I got up about two hours later, I realized that moment I got up, my ice pick fell out of my pocket because I remember feeling it, but I thought it was grass. Anyway, the ice pick I made in the video on YouTube is in the grass at the Elephant's Trunk Flea Market in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, But while I was there, I, I bought a little bag of rusty tools and in the bag of rusty tools was an ice pick with the handle rotted off. And that is my my new ice pick that I'm using right now. It's uh, this really thick hardened steel, probably from you know I don't know, 100 years ago. And then I made a new handle for it. But this actual ice pick itself was super rusty. And I knew right away what it was. I was like, oh, that's an ice pick because it's got a little knurling here, but there was no handle on it. So I made a new handle. So, so I lost one and gained one on the same day. So what's, what's why do you carry an ice pick? Um, if I have to tell you... <laughs> <kill you>. no. <laughs> Honestly, I'm telling you, if you guys begin to carry an ice pick, you'll start to realize old. It's the same thing we just talked about with the CNC. The tool will inspire the use. If you have it, you're going to say, "Oh, oh, I can use my ice pick to get that other thing I dropped between the seats of the car, or mm. I can ascribe it, or I'm going to, you know." Actually, talking about the CNC, a lot of times when you guys cut through all the way through material on the CNC, the little part becomes loose. And it gets jammed in the blade sometimes. You know, if I'm doing, like I just recently cut up all that bamboo and the little doodads in between the cutouts, I try and leave tabs on everything, but sometimes the tabs aren't enough and the piece goes flying. I reach in there like a surgeon with the tip of my ice pick and I hold the piece of wood down when I know the blade is about to cut it free. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's like a third hand in yeah. a lot of instances. Nice. So I, I hold it, you know, I, I, Almost never hurt anybody with it. I'm always, almost <laughs> always using it as a tool. Almost. <laughs> no, that's just a dumb joke. Yeah. But of course, I, I use it as a tool for so many instances. Like a lot of times when I use thinner in the shop, like uh, acetone or, or paint thinner, and I'm kind of pouring it into rags, I never open the cap. I just puncture a little tiny hole in the corner of the, the can and wet the rag. With, and then I'll just put a little screw right into that hole that I just punctured. So... I, I, I reach for it so often, and then now the people around me, like David and, and Taylor, they all have their own ice pick, but they don't carry it as much as me. So they're always like, oh, give me your ice pick, give me your ice pick, I want to do, do something, or I drop something. A lot of times I'll pick things up and I'll just poke at them like a guy cleaning the park. I'll just like grab something on the table, I'll poke at it with the ice pick and bring it to me. Huh. 
It's I, I use it as a fork sometimes when I eat with it. Of course, everyone gets mad at me. <laughs> Do you ever use it while you're teaching class to point at the board or? Oh, you know how many times I pulled it out to point at my phone, like like I'm showing somebody where like something is on the map. I pull my ice pick out and I point at it. It's I'm telling you, it, when I first started carrying one all the time, it was a little, it was an, an, uh, a seamstress awl that I got at a, a sewing supply shop in Midtown. And I used to just literally pin it through the side of my pants. I would just stick it in and out, and it would always be in my pants, pinned through the side of my pants. A few too many times I accidentally poked Taylor when we're walking together, and she screams at me. She's like, that MF and thing just stabbed me again. <laughs> or I stabbed myself. You know, a couple of times I sat down and all of a sudden the thing is like totally stuck in the side of my leg. And so that's when I, I was inspired to make a sheath for it. And I made the sheath with the with the gold loop. And so now it's always in my pocket. It's uh, I'm telling you, if you guys begin to carry something like that, just carry it for a couple of days and then report back to me. Tell me if I wasn't right. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I got to go find an ice pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I, I always – and there, now there's – Maybe Dave, I'll tell David to photograph some of them. We have them all around the shop. Like I bought like 20 ice picks for 50 cents from some website because I thought I was going to start making these ice picks and I never did. But we're, we always have the handles around. And because I have so many of them, if we need a custom tool, we just heat the tip up and hammer it flat or bend it into a loop or whatever. Taylor really uses it a lot for the shoemaking stuff she does. So it's, they're great tools to have around to modify as well. Like I said, you could put like a right angle on it if you're trying to scribe or scratch something or – you know, if you're trying to pull like a, a spring, I forget what they call like a spring loop off of like, you know, if you're doing some mechanic work, uh, they just come in handy. I'm just so used to them now. It's just, and then, like I said, the people around me are always asking for mine. That's my ice pick story. Well, we should end it on, on that valuable lesson right there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, it's definitely, everybody needs to go find an ice pick. Where, <laughs> where would you find one before we end? Let me right, ask right, that. Right. <laughs> You can get I, I buy them at garage sales. Okay. There's a lot of like little antique shops that always have um always have because people look for the for the advertising art on the handles typically like Coca-Cola or Budweiser or you know, anything that would be like in a bar situation. So you always see them like vintage ones at, at antique fairs. But uh you can go buy one right now at the hardware store. They still sell them. Hmm. And they're like two bucks. Have you ever come across like a shady group of people and just to be prepared, like put your hand on your ice pick to get it out if needed? About 10 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in New York City. Yeah. So. <laughs> I tell Taylor, I said, Taylor, if you know, because she wanders the street sometimes going to and from friends' houses. I said, keep your hand on your ice pick. I'll tell her, take this ice pick with you. I said, if somebody, you know, comes to you and you sting them with this, they will not want to get stung again and they won't even know where it's coming from and they'll be like what's going on ow that hurt my adrenaline's rushing stab them again and then run away yeah. all right so bob you and i we're on a race to get an ice pick okay all right <laughs> sounds good <laughs> yeah i've so, never had to hurt anybody but you know thankfully well, thank, thank I goodness won't. Cool. Well, we'll wrap it up there for this episode. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. If you have topic ideas for stuff you want us to talk about in the future, we would love those. Um, you can send them to, for now, we'll send them to info at makingitpodcast.com. We'll probably update that address at some point, but send them there for now. If you have any questions or, or ideas, send them over there. And from Jimmy, David, and myself, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Have Thank a good you. one. Good night, guys.